are live. So good afternoon. Good morning, everyone, depending on where you're joining from. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we're really excited because all month long, we are highlighting, celebrating epic Earth, amazing places, people, creatures from all around the globe. Today, we're going a little off the planet to get a little sense of some really cool stuff going on in space as well. So we're so thrilled you guys could join us as we kick off a whole new decade. We've got three classes joining us from across North America right now. So I'm going to give them a chance to say a little hello. We've got Miss Marriott's grade fours in Vancouver, BC. Hi, guys. That's us. Hello. Hey. 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 She promised me the students are all polished today. So I'm going to see how true that is a little bit later. We've got Mr. Allen's grade sixes in Brampton, Ontario. Hi, guys. Hey, every time we have a brand new class, you guys are so enthusiastic. I love it. Uh, and last but not least, we've got Miss Johnson's grade sixes in Spruce Grove, Alberta, where earlier today they said it was negative 39 with a wind chill. So thank you guys for braving that. Come in. Thank you for surviving the cold to come see us today. All right, of course, the reason you guys are all here is for our speaker. So we are joined live by Tabitha Shepard. She is a master's student at the University of Western Ontario. She studies planetary sciences and geology. She studies other worlds, the rocks, the earth, the things that are on them that make them up. And she's going to share a little bit about her work today. She's going to share a little bit about space and then highlight the amazing Junior Astronauts Program, which we have been highlighting all year long, late last year, in through March, an amazing project that you guys can and, and possibly have already gotten involved with. So without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us, Tabitha, and take it away. Hello, thanks for having me. It's uh, my first time speaking on one of these, so you'll have to give me a little bit of a break, but I'm a brand new master's student here um, at the University of Western Ontario. I do study geology and planetary science, um, but I'll bring up my shared screen now. Just to get started, when they told me I was having to talk about my research and space, I was like, oh, so just me, myself, and space. So that's what named my presentation. And then also some of the junior astronauts wanted, um, actually headed up to the Yukon on Sunday for junior astronauts. So I'll be feeling some of that minus 39 degree weather soon. So. I'll be with you guys up there. Um, but once again, my name is Tabitha. Uh, just to start a little bit about me, I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Ottawa. I also worked in a lot of science outreach for the Museum of Science and Technology there, but also worked at Parliament for three years, um, kind of created a secondary love for space policy and law for me and wanting to work in that a little bit. So uh, if you have questions about policy, uh, it's a little bit of a nerdy thing to like but then traveled all the way down to London, Ontario here. A little bit of change of scenery for me to the University of Western Ontario. This is our Cronin Observatory where we host a lot of events um, and open telescope nights as well, if ever you wanna look at the stars. And then as well, this is my lab with my two little um, plushies, which are my mascots, Mars and Comet, since I do study impact cratering and Mars. So they're my little buddies. What do I do? I'm a geologist, so I'm a little bit of a nerd for rocks. You get to travel a lot as a geologist. So a lot of big trucks up here in Sudbury was where this photo was taken. These two down here, a little bit warmer in Death Valley in uh, Nevada. So a lot of hot weather down there um, and in the salt flats and also got to go to the Bahamas and we're always carrying around rocks with us. So a little bit about that. Um, but geology was never quite enough for me. Uh, I loved the rocks, but there was something missing. So then why space? My whole time studying geology, I was going to different conferences, like this one here was hosted at U Ottawa um, with Canadian space agencies, uh, wanting to learn a little bit more about space. Uh, I headed to the space summit in Ottawa as well. And then this photo here is when we were back at the Institute launch here at Western when we launched our Institute. So you might wonder why I wanna study space. And it's actually because of where I grew up. So I grew up in a town called Sudbury um, and Sudbury itself is a giant impact crater. So this is the map down here. So when I grew up right here in Chelmsford in my home, I little did I know that I was living in the type of geological feature that I would study for the rest of my life. Uh, and when I started studying geology and I found out that my hometown was a giant hole in the ground 
made by a 250 kilometer diameter meteorite, I had to know more. So I was obsessed with learning about the meteorite strike uh, on Sudbury, and then now I'm studying uh, impact craters. So a little bit of a jump ahead to what I study is impact craters. We already discussed that a little bit. So I study what happens on the earth after a giant meteorite slams into our earth. It's actually a huge catastrophic event. Um, it can actually cause things like the extinction of the dinosaurs. So that was linked to Chicxulub in Mexico. Um, the Sudbury one was even bigger than Chicxulub. It was the second largest that we know of. So even bigger than what killed all of the dinosaurs. It's pretty intense. So impact craters are very uh, vast in what you can study about them. A lot of things happen in a really short amount of time. So you're probably wondering what I study about impact craters. And that's a little bit more specific. So we're going to have to jump to hydrothermal systems. So I can see some of you. Can you raise your hand if you've heard the word hydrothermal before? Hey, good job. Oh, hands. That's great. Wow. So you probably are familiar with hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. That's what we have on the screen right now. Um, so they're very common there and they're made by volcanic events. So kind of like mini volcanoes heating up the water. But it just means water for hydro and relating to heat. So it doesn't necessarily have to be at the bottom of the ocean. When they are at the bottom of the ocean, though, we often learn about them as areas where tons and tons of living creatures like to live, kind of like all of these. You can find some weird stuff, and it's actually thought to be one of the places where life was first created. In really, really hot water, there's tons of nutrients coming up in those puffs of smoke and water. So it's very nutrient rich and a lot of little living creatures like zooplanktons and archaeobacteria can thrive in those types of environments, which you wouldn't think so because it's so hot, but they can actually live there. So hydrothermal life on earth, uh, these hydrothermal vents are thought to be the birthplace of life inside of the ocean. But there's actually talk more now that as impact craters cool, they are a great environment for microbacterial life to thrive. So potentially the birthplace of life on the actual surface of the earth would instead be through impact craters. So you can in fact get these hydrothermal vents right after an impact happens. If you can picture in your head, a giant meteorite slamming into the earth, do you think it would be pretty hot? I can, yeah. ask, the, I can ask the classes if you'd like. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So Ms. Marriott's class, what do you think? If a giant meteorite slams into the earth, is it pretty hot? Really hot? Cool. What's going on? We're getting a lot of yes on that Super one. Super hot. Okay. Super hot. <laughs> yeah. Go for Great. It. So very hot. Uh, it actually creates a lot of heat because all of that, if you know about kinetic energy, when it slams into the ground will actually create thermal energy and it will heat up and sometimes even melt the rocks that are there. So if that meteorite slams into a location on earth, let's say the ocean, since we have quite a lot of it, it's got tons of water around it and tons of heat. So it's going to produce one of these hydrothermal systems and be great for bacterial life. So maybe that's where life started here on our earth. But let's leave earth for a second since we are talking about space. And that's kind of what I like to research as well. This photo here that I have on the screen, does anyone know where this is? Yeah, so let me ask Mr. Allen's class. Do you have any idea where this thing is in space? Mars. Mars. Mars, Mars, a universal chorus of Mars. Yeah, so this is on Mars and it's actually the landing ellipse. So this yellow ellipse here, this little oval, is where the Curiosity rover was set to land and it did land. Do you know where Curiosity landed? What this is called? Yeah, okay, let me ask Ms. Johnson's class. Does anyone have any idea where the Curiosity rover set down? Mountains, okay. <laughs> so yeah, almost correct. It was in a crater called Gale Crater. So this was a special crater and they chose it because of characteristics. It brings us to the question, well, why does space exploration focus on craters so much? Almost all of the possible landing sites for 
the Mars 2020 rover, or even some rovers going to the moon, all go to craters. And I can ask you guys why you think they go to craters. I do have a list set up. So if you want to ask some classes what they think, uh, why do you think they choose craters to send uh, rovers to? Yeah, so let's start with Miss Marriott's class. Craters, what, what makes craters so special? What do you think, folks? Why are they choosing craters? Oh, H, one right here. Because well, maybe we're looking for life. Okay. Yeah. Great. We're looking for life, definitely. Yeah, Mr. Allen's yeah. class. What do you guys think? Yeah, yeah Mr. Allen's group. Yeah. Maybe because, um, oh, can I see it? <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> Smoother landing. Okay, great Smoother answer. Smoother landing. I actually had that on as an option too because it does offer you smooth landing, but um, you can find a lot of smooth landing sites pretty much anywhere. But nice. craters do have a really great smooth spot on the inside here uh, that you can see in that little yellow ellipse. So, absolutely. All right, and then I'll just ask Miss Johnson's class too, really quick. Miss Johnson's class, what do you guys think? Um, we had biodiversity. We had um, gathering samples. Yeah, better um, for samples. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, that's it for now. Yeah, I love these answers, guys. These are great. <laughs> well, you guys pretty much hit the nail on the head right there. It's pretty great. So, sample collection. Uh, that mentioned, yes. So we have something we call ejecta here. Um, so that's all the rocks that were originally where the meteorite hit, but got thrown all the way outside of the crater. And that has a good mix of the rocks from where you hit. So if you're collecting samples of the ejecta, you're kind of getting like a two, three, four, five in one. You're getting many rocks in one sample in little chunks. So it's, it's easier to collect samples there. And we also have this middle part here, which at Gale Crater is a little bit different than most craters, but you can get what we call a central uplift. So you have the middle of the crater that gets brought up and that brings deeper rocks all the way up to the surface. So we're able to collect rocks that may not have been at the surface originally. So we get a lot more options of things to study at craters on top of studying how cratering works, um, which we also study here on earth with earth craters. And then as well, minerals at Gale Crater specifically, using radars and satellites were found called clays and sulfates. And those are byproducts of water. So to create these minerals, you have to have water somewhere, meaning there was water at Gale Crater at some point, which could also link to possible hydrothermal activity and possible life. So a little quote here from NASA's pre-launch, Scientists chose Gale Crater as the landing site for Curiosity because it has many signs that water was present over its history. And water is a key ingredient of life as we know it. So craters do make that great choice. Um, and now you kind of know why these rovers choose craters more often than anywhere else to land uh, and study. And why hydrothermal uh, systems in these craters can help us find life um, on other planets and is a key place for us to take a look at. That pretty much is the end of my research. That's what I'm working on is hydrothermal alteration in France. Uh, so I'll be at the Rachachois crater in France is where I'll be working. Um, but this is a cute little comic that I like. Um, Mars saying you need to get a life. Yeah. Me, I already have something like 7 billion. Um, so hopefully we'll find some life on other planets as well. Whee! All right. Brings us to junior astronauts. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> Which classes have heard a little bit about junior astronauts before? Okay, Mr. Allen's group, a few students in Ms. Johnson's class. Ms. Marion, have you guys taken part before or not? No. No, first time, first. okay. Amazing. Nice mix. Good mix, yeah. So the junior astronauts campaign is really uh, working to um, kind of bring some more life and young life into the space industry. And it's a one week uh, fully paid summer camp at the CSA in saint Sebastien, Quebec. Uh, so what they're doing is they're having um, a search for the next generation of astronauts. Here we have moon mission written and a big moon and a little astronaut 
because uh, if you are unaware, we do have a project called the Lunar Gateway, which Canada has signed on to be a part of, uh, which is almost like a mini international space station, but going to be around the moon. And it will be habited for not all year long, but a couple months out of the year. And since Canada is helping with the Lunar Gateway, we will get the chance to send Canadian astronauts to that station, which will probably likely be someone about your age headed up uh, in a couple of years from now. So this camp is, is helping to search for the next generation of astronauts that may be up in the moon uh, station or maybe on the surface of the moon as well. So it's really exciting. Um, how it works is there's three streams of activities. Um, and if you do one activity from one stream, you have the chance to apply for a astronaut or someone who works at CSA to come and speak at your school. So you'll enter into a random draw, uh, having done one of the stream activities. Uh, and if you do all three stream activities, you can apply three times uh, for that uh, visit from an astronaut. And each youth who completes uh, one from each of the stream activities also then gets to apply to win the trip for the junior astronauts camp in St. Sevier, the one week fully paid trip um, to train as if you were an astronaut. Uh, very good, very good opportunity. So um, one thing that is interesting to consider is also the fact that um, a lot of these uh, astronauts do have very different backgrounds um, in a whole bunch of different fields usually related in some way to the STEM field, um, but there's not just one specific um, science more than others. So studying anything at all, you can become an astronaut, uh, which is really exciting. But the activity that we're going to be going through today, um, if you haven't already done a patch maker or making the patches, uh, we'll be making uh, patches similar to this one here as a part of the arts and communication field, um, activity. So how this activity works is we're making patches. If ever you've seen an astronaut on their suit, they typically have um, patches on their blue suits. And these patches represent very specific things. And each astronaut, when you become an astronaut, you create your own personal patch. Kind of like this one here is David St. Jacques patch. And these patches are meant to represent um, your mission in space and represent you as an astronaut. So for example, David St. Jacques here, um, what you need is your name. So he has his name here, his space agency name. So Canadian space agency, and then a meaningful image. The meaningful image is usually the part that sticks out to people. And they're not always round patches like this. Chris Hadfield actually had his in the shape of a guitar pick because he loved to play guitar. So David St. Jacques here, his patch, just for a little bit of a background, um, it is uh, quite specific. So in the middle inside, uh, we have the North Star with the compass rose here because the North Star is often used to guide explorers. So he's talking about the North Star guiding him up into space. You also have the other stars um, around the North Star, which is other people that help him um, get his mission into space. And then as well, the four colors here are four colors representing um, red is energy and passion, orange is creativity, white for science, and blue for international collaboration. And all of this is looking down onto the earth uh, because he felt like he wanted to look back at the earth um, he had posted a lot of images looking down at the earth um, online as well during his time up on the mission. So you can tell they're all very specific and for a reason. If you were to make your own patch, the meaningful image would be what space would mean to you, what you want to accomplish in space. Um, so I invite you to make your own astronaut patches. Um, this one here. So like I was saying, stars beyond earth, north star, and four colors for innovation is David St. Jacques specific patch here. But think about if you were to make your own, what meaningful image you would want to include. So we've got some examples here on the screen. Uh, I know Julie Payette's right here is one of my favorites uh, with a cat on the rocket ship. 
but a whole bunch of different um, meaningful images that mean something to each one of the Canadian astronauts. Kind of like this one here. So here, David Williams, Dr. David Williams from the CSA, during this mission here, he was actually sent up to repair um, parts of the Canadarm. So you see him here servicing the Canadarm with Earth in the background. So if you were to make your own patch, think about what you would want. We've got some examples of some handmade ones as well. Um, has anyone already made a patch? Do you... Yeah. So if anyone in the classes has made one, you can put up your hand. And if you guys haven't yet, then it's a challenge to do that after you guys are done. Doesn't yeah, look like anyone's done one yet, which is like, oh, we got one one kid maybe. <laughs> We're just waiting. <laughs> which is awesome if you have, but if you haven't, that's just something an opportunity, to, something you can do after we're done this session. Come up with ideas today as you guys are brainstorming. I see some kids writing some stuff down. So yeah. If you, write, if you make one during this session, you want to share it during the Q and A period. We'd love that. Um, but no worries if not. The main point is to get across what we're trying to do here, and it's fantastic. You guys are keen. Exactly, and an activity to do um, with. Your entire class is also mission patches. So you can come up with your own class patch. Um, so mission patches here have a little bit of a difference than the astronaut patches because they represent the crew that is going up to the ISS. And next time you see a crew going to the ISS, check on their shoulders and they'll actually have two patches on them. They'll have the mission patch from the crew that is already up in the ISS that they are joining as well as their own mission patch, which they got to design. So this is an example of David Saint-Jacques, the 58th um, sent up to the ISS mission patch. So it has the three crew member names instead of just the astronaut's name, your mission number here, which is 58, and a meaningful image. Again, this one had the ISS, uh, the compass rose to represent that same guiding star, and the Earth down in the background. So Earth below, compass rose, and the passing of the ISS is what they chose to represent on their crew mission. Um, as important is guiding and looking down on the earth. Whereas if you design your own mission patch, it'll be all of your class's name all around the side, your mission number, which you can choose pretty much anything, and an image that all of you can agree on is your mission um, in space and what you would want to accomplish up in space. So that's something else you can do. Maybe make it bigger so you can put all of your names around it. Might be a good idea. But yeah, I invite you to make your own patch. And then if you have any questions for me, I'm here as well. Thank you so, so much, Tabitha. That was spectacular. Um, and so, yeah, for our class that are joining live, if you guys want to ask questions about Tabitha's work, all the stuff she shared in the beginning, ask questions about the mission patch exercise or anything else with junior astronauts, go for it. So I'm going to start. Uh, we also have a couple of groups watching on YouTube live. If you guys want to type in questions in the chat bar, please do. Uh, but yeah, let's kick it off uh, with uh, Miss Johnson's class. If you guys want to start us with a question, go right ahead. Bye. Hello, we do have one question here. So you can Perfect. So just come stand here and put it right into the camera. Not to bend, not bend. What's the most interesting rock that you found? Ooh, the most interesting rock. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah, that's difficult because one of the most interesting rocks that I find in general that I find very cool are rocks called dunites. So they're made up almost completely of a rock uh, mineral called olivine. And it's really, really high temperature and really, really high pressures. And we actually went to find dunite on one of my field courses in North Carolina. So seeing that, um, you realize just how deep of a piece of the earth you're holding, because those types of rocks only come from kilometers down into the earth. Um, so to hold a piece of earth that came from so deep was, was really interesting to me. Um, whereas some of the rocks that I had that I'm working on maybe some of the most interesting and weird rocks because I don't really understand how they were made yet. Um, so I find impact rocks also really, really interesting and curious um, since I can't really figure out how they were made. Super cool. Um, there was something addressed in one of our sessions the other day also in space and I'd like you to touch on upon it as well. So the gentleman talked about the fact that every year expeditions go to Antarctica to look for meteorites from other places. Could you explain a little about that? Because I think a lot of kids don't know about that. It's super cool. Yes, yeah. So I actually am hoping to go on one of those trips eventually. So um, we go down to Antarctica because since there's a lot of flat ice and a lot of areas on that really white background, finding those little pieces of meteorites that would touch down there are a lot easier. Um, so they send out some crews to look for some cool meteorites. 
Um, apparently, from what I've heard, they usually find one really cool meteorite per session per going. Um, sometimes you pick up a pebble and you're like, is this a meteorite? And it's completely not a meteorite. So hopefully, uh, I, I hope to learn even more about it. Um, I'm not sure if there's a reason if a, a lot of meteorites tend to touch down on the South Pole for some reason, um, might be due to our magnetic field, but I think it might just be because uh, yeah. of the well, white, it's easier to find them. Yeah, very cool. Uh, and we really hope you get a chance to do that. If you do, you have to come back and tell us all about it. I'll tell you all about it. Lovely. All right, uh, how about Mr. Allen's class? If you guys have a question, come on up. Um, why do uh, the median always hurt, hit Earth, but not other planets? Yeah. Yeah, so meteorites actually are hitting other planets all the time. So it's constantly happening. The pretty much only reason why we're not seeing as many here on Earth is because a lot of them will burn up before they touch down on Earth or break up into little pieces. Um, there are some cool videos from uh, Russia a little while back when you're seeing some meteorite pieces come down and you're watching glass shatter because it comes down so quickly, it'll shatter almost every piece of glass because of the sound and is very loud. Um, so if you look up those videos on YouTube, uh, Russia meteorite, uh, I forget what it's called. Um, they even sometimes come down here on earth, but they land in really tiny little pieces. Uh, we don't see that much here on earth anymore because the large pieces, uh, we're watching them on telescopes, but they, they keep missing us. Thank goodness. Uh, because if they would touch down, that would be very catastrophic. Uh, but we haven't had one in a really long time. But other planets will sometimes have some new ones. It just depends on if something comes in contact or not uh, one, with our orbits. Uh, a great example of, of them hitting other planets and, and other bodies, look at the moon. Look at how cratered the moon is. And those are all impacts from other things that have hit it throughout history. So yeah, yeah, definitely. And Mars as well is covered in those impact craters. Um, the, the life of humans is very, very small when we're talking about space. Uh, so cratering has been happening over the course of millions and billions of years. So we're in this little short period where we've lived that we haven't really seen any meteorites or big ones come down, um, which we're lucky for that. Yeah. You mentioned them burning up in our atmosphere. And I just want to highlight for the classes because a lot of people don't you know, compare that to what it actually looks like. So when a meteorite burns up in our atmosphere, what do we call that here on Earth? What do we see it as? Shooting star? Yeah. You'll see meteor showers or shooting stars as you're seeing them burn up into the atmosphere. Fantastic. All right. Uh, Miss Marriott's class, if you guys want to ask a question, come on up. Yeah, we have a question from Amina. Go ahead and ask your question. Here's Amina. How do people store air up into rocket ships? Ah. Ah, well, how do they store air? I know um, I'm not as much of an engineer myself. I know they bring up reserves of liquid oxygen in tanks and then they can become gas um, to be able to breathe, but I'm not sure how they store it, probably very safely. <laughs> I really don't like, especially if gas is being com compressed into a little container, you'd want it to be nice and safe. Uh, so I'm, they usually store them in these these big tanks, um, and I'm pretty sure they bring it up as liquid oxygen. If I hopefully I got that right. Very cool. I love that. Very safely as part of that. That's fantastic. Very safely. Uh, all right. Uh, let's do another round of questions, guys. From Miss Johnson's class. If you guys have a second, come on up. Yes, we do. Um, Shyless, you can go ahead and ask your question. Um, what types of rocks hit? How many species of rocks on Earth? How many types of rocks are on Earth? Yeah, great question. Well, if I want to make it easy on myself, I can just break it up into three. So you got your sedimentary <laughs> rocks, which are made up of sediment. So if you go to the beach and you pick up a, a bowl full of sand and then you just squished it really hard and maybe added some water and made it solid, that would be a sedimentary rock since it was like made up of stuff. Uh, you can also get igneous rocks, which those are like if you've ever been to Hawaii and you're seeing these pillowy, beautiful black rocks, um, those all come from magma. So they'll crystallize from magma. And then you've got the in-betweener called metamorphic rocks, where it, it either was an igneous rock or a sedimentary rock before, but it has been changed in some way. It was either heated up 
or pushed on really hard by the earth and it changed something about it and it became metamorphic, it changed. So keeping it easy on me, those are the three main types, <laughs> but in there it becomes just like biology. There's so many, so many different kinds of rocks. Yeah. Um, and if you guys ever get a chance to go to museums, and I know all of you guys are, are in towns that are close to major natural history museums. Uh, if you do that, you'll see the amount of gems and rocks in the geology section are, are virtually endless. There are thousands and thousands of different kinds. So it's a, a really mm -hmm. beautiful uh, science. And something cool as well to think about is uh, a lot of the gems that you would know, the gem name is different from the mineral name. So uh, to think of one, I have sapphire because it's my birthstone. But sapphire is actually a mineral called corundum and is the exact same mineral as ruby, except just different impurities that make them different colors. Super cool. Thank you so much. So we need having geology. We barely ever covered geology on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. This is awesome. Um, all right. Uh, Mr. Allen's class, if you guys have a second question, go for it. Um, um, so what would you do with a rock you found on Mars but has like contaminants that are like undiscovered? Would you bring it back to Earth or would you keep it at Mars? That's a really deep question. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that is a really great question because I can almost link it into kind of me liking space policy and stuff because that's all something that we would have to decide uh, here on Earth of whether we bring it back or not. So some scientists would want to definitely bring it back, but maybe find a way to contain it and make sure it's it's under a vacuum or uh, some way of keeping the contamination um, separate, kind of like when someone's sick and you quarantine them, you can just quarantine the rock. But then also some people might think it would be too dangerous and that we should just analyze it there and leave it there. Uh, so there'll definitely be that battle between safety, security, and science or development through science. So it, it would probably come down to some kind of democracy and, and votes and figuring out exactly how dangerous that contaminant is. Um, is there a way to contain it when it came back? Um, but that would be a super interesting question. If ever it happens, I'd be tuning in on the news to see what the panel of people making that decision would decide. Yeah, you guys are about the age too, where you guys will be the sort of people that would make decisions like that for people coming back from Mars, which is very cool. Um, yeah. Quick segue, and a lot of kids don't know this, uh, when the first astronauts came back from the moon, the very first ones, so Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, they were so worried that they might have contamination on them that it's not like they got off the ship and came and did a parade. They took them and put them in a room alone for days and days on end to make sure that they weren't sick with any weird moon bugs. So uh, a very cool thing and, and something that we'll have to explore when we go to Mars and beyond. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, let's wrap up with a question from Ms. Marriott's class. This has been some fantastic uh, questions, guys. So come on up. All right, we've got a question from Esther. Esther, hi, Esther. How, um, how, um, go ahead. How <laughs> many, how, how many years have you been studying space? Yeah. Believe it or not, um, ever since I was about, mm, like maybe nine or 10, I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, I always thought it would never, ever happen. But ever since I've been reading books about space, I would have like little um, magazines sent to me from uh, Planetary Sciences World, um, had a very supporting family, but then thought I was going to become a doctor. So I completely switched over. Um, medical family, you know. Mm -hmm. So I actually studied medicine and then geology all through my undergrad degree. And I thought I'd never be able to study space. I thought it was too, it was too cool and too separate. Like only the really cool people got to study space. But then when I became obsessed with meteorite impacts, so almost about four years ago when I started my degree, I realized, you know what? Maybe we can try, maybe anyone can study space. And I found out you really can't. There's room for everyone in space. Uh, whether you are a designer, you can make patches, uh, an, just an artist, musician, filmer, there's really a spot for everyone in the space industry. So I think this is my first year actually working and studying in space, um, but been dreaming of it for years. Fantastic. Uh, we're so excited for you and it's such a fantastic institution at Western Ontario. So you're, you're in for a real treat over the next few years. Um, for our classes, again, that was a great quick thing to end us off with, uh, to encourage you guys to go explore on your own, to go get involved with junior astronauts. I'll pass along the link when we're done so you guys can engage and do some of these projects together with your class or as individuals. 
win a visit to astronaut training camp, win a visit from an astronaut to come to your class, all these amazing things out there uh, for kids across Canada and a really exciting time and opportunity to be interested in space with space tourism, with going back to the moon, going to Mars soon. It is the best time for you kids to be involved in this, in this field uh, ever. And so what we do at the end of every hangout uh, time with that is I'm going to demute everyone's microphones. And so boys and girls, if you guys could join me in saying a huge thank you to Tabitha for joining us today. You are all demuted. Go for it. Awesome. <laughs> See, it's better. It's better than a typical seminar or a class, Tabitha. I promise. It's fantastic stuff. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. This was fantastic. We really appreciate it, Tabitha, and uh, hope to see you back soon. I'm sure I will. All right. Have a wonderful.